Mary Lou, Bella, thank you so much for being back on the show. Best practices, um, director, filmmaker. Um, really glad to see you again. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. Um, pre-production, we're jumping right into it. What have oh. you learned? Um, what are the things that are tried and true that you go back to every time? Where is your mind in pre-production? Well, you know, in prep being probably the most important part of the um, director's, you know, toolkit, I would say um, the first thing I do, first of all, I want to divide things into what you write and what you don't write. So in my job, because I, you know, mostly direct television, um, uh, I'm getting scripts that I have not written myself. Um, and in terms of preparing those, um, that first read is so vital. And I, it's sacrosanct in my world that I will read it without any disturbances. I will literally lock myself in the closet if I have to, because I want to see what my first visceral reaction as an audience member, because as a director, that's what I ultimately have to be. I have to be that audience member. Um, and that first read is so important in terms of my impressions. So um, after I do my first read, I do a second read if I have time, but usually that second read is when I start dissecting the script. And I'm analyzing the story for both character um, and plot. Um, with a plot, I use a, a handy dandy little um, uh, vehicle called a director's diagram where I break down the plot into um, its components in terms of A, B, C subplots. Um, and then I usually have a column where I um, talk about um, to myself about what are things I need to remember if it's, for instance, a procedural or a whodunit. Um, I want the clues as they unfold to the audience, not to the characters in the show, but to the audience. Um, and I will, oh, I do this for every single thing I direct. I want to um, basically uh, synthesize it down to um, what the writer probably started with, which was um, what's the theme? What's the threads that go through that, that connect everything? But then more important, um, you know, what was that one line that, you know, uh, log line that synthesized what this episode or what this short film, which is really what it is, is about. And then, um, you know, analyze it into its components. Now, I use this while directing as well, because if um, shooting out of order, which is the nature of our business, um, let's say I'm shooting something that takes place four scenes into this one storyline, not the, the whole episode, but the storyline, I can say, hey, this and this happened before and this and this is gonna happen after. So just locating, especially now in, in episodic, we're, usually, we're often shooting blocks. And so people are try, keeping track of an entire, you know, it's the length of a short, of a full length film because it's two episodes. Um, and just keeping track of um, that sort of thing. Um, I also analyze for story or for character. Um, I use something, if I need to really, if something's very, very, very dense, I use what I call a cow chart, where I analyze for three things. Um, who is, what is a character? That's the C, think of himself or say about himself. Mm. What do others, the O, others say about the character? And then what does the writer? And um, nearly always what the writer says is always true. But what a character says about himself may not be true. And definitely what others say is always opinion is always you know uh, has a point of view um and sometimes characters lie about themselves to themselves so um i'm analyzing that and not just what the words are but especially what the subtext is and reading between the lines um those are my first two things um or first three things i do the director's diagram the cow chart um and that first read are probably my most important things and then i get down to the nitty gritty work of you know speaking to all the departments about what they're going to need, you know, from props, set deck, locations, everything else. Uh, I do a lot of director scouts to find, you know, the thing that looks right for our show. Um, I tour or walk the standing sets usually with the production designer. Um, and then um, 
it's, you know, onto the races in terms of shot listing, which is probably the bulk of the work. Um, I think any director who goes into a film or um, short or otherwise without knowing exactly what they're going to do is disrespectful basically to everyone on the film because I want to be prepared and not that I'm not open completely to something that might come up in the moment and be it inspired by um, a prop that or a piece of set deck that shows up and I go oh my gosh like for instance I'll give you an example um, there was an actor in a scene I was directing last week for a Netflix series who glanced who had a transition from and it was a discovery an aha moment but she glanced over and I kept thinking in her close way I said what is she looking at and I went to set and she was looking at headphones and it was based on the the uh look was based on the fact that she was going to set, suggest something musical and her look at the um headphones was what gave her the idea and I went, oh, well, I need to tell the audience that. So, of course, I went from her close-up and I tagged the headphones and came back to her close-up. And, you know, it was a great storytelling device that I wouldn't have done um, had I not seen the actor in the moment do that. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have come from her close-up to, to show the audience something else. Um, but, of course, I had had that close-up planned um, as I was, you know, the person she was speaking to, that close-up planned. Uh, as well as what the opening shot was and all those things. So um, coming prepared makes for efficiency on set. And even if I have to completely revamp what I'm doing for time or any other reasons, in the last two years it's been because of COVID sometimes, I always will know what the components of the scene and what I need to tell the story so that even if I do a complete switch to another set to some or whatever, I know the ingredients going into this particular recipe. That's so, great. Those are some great tools. Um, absolutely. I would love to put out some links to um, that cow chart as well as the director's well, diagram. It, they're both in my, the book I co-wrote with Bethany Rooney, Directors Tell the Story, available at Focal Press. And I will send you a link. Cool. Yeah. And it's um, available, you know, on Amazon and your library, probably. <laughs> that's great. Um, when you're able, how do you like to, in pre-production, work with your actors and your DP? Okay, so I rarely get to work with my actors in pre-production except to cast them. And then if I haven't met them and they're already like in an ongoing series, um, I always take the time to either write them a note and say, hey, if there's anything you want to talk about before we get set, please, please mm. uh, let me know. We'll um, do a Zoom call. I'm going to a CBS show next where I don't know any of the actors. So I will have my um, AD um, uh, schedule like a 10 minute Zoom call with each of them in order to just say, hello, we don't have to discuss the script. I just want you to see what my face looks like without a mask on. Mm -hmm. um, and um, just get to know each other because, you know, direct the director-actor relationship is so much based on trust. Now, my cinematographer <laughs> and my production designer are probably the two people I interact most with during prep or pre-production. Um, uh, Hopefully I'm on a show where that director of photography isn't shooting the episode before because very often on big shows they have rotating. So I get to prep. And in that case, you know, um, they're part of that decision in terms of um, once I, I usually choose a location and I, I very much listen to my production designers. Um, and sometimes it's budget concerns. Um, sometimes it's what we call two furs or three furs. This is this, let's say it's a I had once a um a lobby of a movie theater that I was gonna blow up. Um, and sometimes one was going to lend itself to being blown up because we were actually using a movie theater and I wasn't really blowing that up. But there were elements that this was a big plex. So I was, they, they could keep the movie theater open for the main lobby and one side of it. And then I just, you know, took over the other side of it. Um, um, so 
we're looking at things like that. And then um, on that same show, I remember being able to use, I think it was a government building. or It had to look like a government building. But I also was, again, blowing something up. <laughs> it was NCS New Orleans. We blow a lot of stuff up on this on that show. Um, but I would um, look to see in the in one of the upstairs offices I did and hallway I did one scene in the basement I played it as another entire um building and shot another scene then I had people pouring out of that building which was a third place um and then I had a lobby which was the same place that people poured out of so but it was two different scenes um so I had I got to only I shot an entire day there I only moved the I only moved the trucks there in the morning and they were out that night. So sometimes it's just about um, looking for a place, you know, and that production designer can help. I'll give you an example. I knew I was going to be shooting an established outdoor school yard in this Netflix series. Um, I just uh, finished doing and I needed a meeting place where a bunch of religious people could meet um and very ecumenical there was a rabbi there was a imam there was a um a baptist minister there was but it was and they were showing me in that same school classrooms and i went no this isn't it this isn't really the tone it's too small to shoot in there's one two three four there's like 10 people in this scene getting equipment and 10 people in this 14 by 14 spaces, ridiculous and ugly. Um, I said, listen, this could take place in any one of these characters, churches or synagogues or meeting halls. Or, And I said to the production designer, what's close by so that if we move the trucks here in the morning, we can literally walk to the next um, or, you know, move our things on carts, which is always economical. Um, and she said, oh, well, there's a church next door. It's usually what we use for holding for the extras when we're in this set. I said, well, show it to me. And it turned out to be one of the most beautiful sets we shot in. And it was huge and spacious and looked amazing. And yeah, yeah. So that was a good twofer. And the production designer is the one who suggested we just go next door. Yeah, no, I get it. There's a lot of sort of logistic um I don't know, variables that you're juggling and trying to get efficient um, during prep. Um, what about specifically with a cinematographer, if you've never worked with them before, um, what's that time that you'd like to have with them in prep? You know, I, I have a new, I have a cinematographer now who I worked with on a different series, um, who I came up with this, and it was just something she suggested, which I loved. Um, and before I shot listed anything, because I usually will um, scout, we'll agree on something, and then I'll go shot list, and then we'll discuss my shot list. Um, and this cinematographer said, why don't we just talk about, let's go through, uh, let's just do a page turn and talk about where the master is. And then I would go shot list. So uh, basically I was choosing um, the side of the line I would be shooting on. Um, and, and we did this and I have to tell you just by deciding that it made my, my shot listing so much more mm. effective. And it was like one of the best experiences. And also it gave her an idea when we talked about it, just basically if she had to order any special equipment, I cool. was going to use a crane in this, was I going to use a diopter was I going to I, there was I think I did a, and I just used the same um piece of equipment where I was the POV of the camera is like this and then it turns and and it actually can do a you know a 180 or even a 360 if you want mm -hmm. but it was the POV of the character who was upside down and then mm -hmm, turned mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and is that um, a diopter no no the diopter does something in terms of uh when something's very very close um, I'll have to look that up. And I can't remember what this instrument was called. Actually, we got something that the equipment didn't work or we didn't know how to work the equipment. Right. Um, and then we shot it actually the next day because we were at the same location. Um, I with, love with it. 
easier piece of equipment that's more old fashioned and we've been using for years, but somebody wanted to try something new and it was a Zeiss product. I don't remember what it was. But. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Um, without getting into the toys, I think the most important thing that you said with the DP, which I really like, it's kind of a, a new concept as well is really nailing that master shot and then working um, the shot list off of that because, you know, you have, you are aligned on that vision that everything else hangs upon. Yes, yes. And, and that's great. Yeah. And um, then also then it lets the cinematographer go to their next step, which is often pre-rigging. So if they know where the master is. They can talk to their rigging crew and say, hey, hang the poles here and here because I know already I'm shooting this way. Yeah, yeah. And that makes, it makes my job more efficient when I get to shoot because- you're not moving around equipment, waiting. Yeah, exactly. It's great. Exactly. Um, production. So here we are. We're there. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, energy. There's a lot of anxiety often. Um, how do you approach it? And um, what's sort of your roadmap? Well, always approach it with love. <laughs> Anybody, uh, you know, I have found that performers who are nervous or aren't giving you what you need, there's a, there's usually one of two reasons. A, they're scared to death um, and just need to know that they're safe. Um, or you disagree on story. And then you fundamentally have to have a discussion about what's the story we're telling um, and to move forward. For instance, I had a scene last week where two very good actors, I'd directed them many times before, came in and their take on the scene which was the opening scene of an episode was completely different from what I wanted. They, they were making it very serious. If I was scoring it, it would have been melancholy. And I went, no. Um, and in that case, you know, it had to be, they had to be nudged into, cause you know, it was very honest and very real what they were doing. There was nothing bad about the acting. It just wasn't the tone I needed and I needed something way lighter. And, um, and it was one brother giving the other one advice. Um, and they took it very seriously. I went, no, 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 no. We can't start the episode this serious because there's no way to where to go if we do that. Um, and I eventually got them there. That same um, scene uh, I'm editing today. And um, the first thing I'm going to tell the editor in her cut to get rid of is the sentimental music that made it equally heavy. And I'm going, no, I don't want that tone at all. So it's nudging. And so that was about the latter thing, I said one of two things, you're either scared or you don't agree on story. And this was a point where we didn't agree on mm. the lightness of the story at this moment. And that the advice wasn't dire. It was, you know, a big brother almost teasing a little brother into, you know, believing this because that was, you know, that's how big brothers should handle, you know, things that might be scary to a little brother. So how do you approach the actors with the adjustments? Um, uh, well, in this case, since I knew the actors very well, I just went, I think I want to take a different approach. And then, uh, sometimes actors can do a 180. In this case, they didn't do it immediately. And I just did uh, quite a few more takes and I kept stroking <laughs> as my, my co-author Bethany Rooney came up with this good stroke, then poke. Hmm. So I said, yes, that's very good, but no, yeah. I really, and then I, I, I use three things when I'm um, directing on set, probably the most, I talk about subtext. I would say under that line, I feel like you're thinking this, but I want you to think this, um, or I give them an action verb or intention. Um, you know, I always say, you know, you're cajoling. I want you to seduce. Mm. Um, or sometimes I use a scale of one to 10 and I would get, yes, I want you to seduce her. That was great. That was a three, but really seduce her. I want you to seduce at a mm -hmm. level 10. Um, mm -hmm. or, so, you know, those three things work, are very expedient. Mm -hmm. They're very succinct and precise in terms of what I'm looking for. Um, and also uh, the rookie mistake I find, because I teach so many directors, is that so many new directors over talk. So here's my, and, and I will side coach when I'm te teaching directors and they're working with actors in front of me. They get two tries. They get two tries to give a note. And then if they do this mistake the third time, I stop them in their tracks. 
Um, and this is the mistake they make uh, in terms of over talking. The moment that they give a note and an actor shakes their head yes, or they acknowledge it, you see it in their eyes like that little spark, or they say, okay, or they say, got it, or yeah, stop talking. Walk out of the set, roll film, and go get exactly because the moment you keep over explaining, you have basically um, diluted that spark of something they want to try, which you suggested to them. So it's about just, I, I, and literally, I will say, <laughs> and I'm harsh, you know, when I'm side coaching, I go, shut up, get out of there, you know, or enough, you know, or she nodded, yes. Stop. Yeah, that's very important. It's a great, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, you don't want to water down the direction. Um, exactly. Yeah. Especially when the, when the actor got it. Yeah. And they, You're done. Like, they're Move inspired. On. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, what about when you're working with a DP on set and you just, you know, there's an angle off, there's light off, there's, you know, props, something's going on and you need to give them an adjustment? Um, I'm, I will, I will stop in the middle of a scene if it's not a crucial emotional moment and I'll go back, especially if it's efficient and if it's a long scene, I'm thinking, God, this happened in the first, or I'll cut and I'll start again and I'll give a, um, an adjustment. But um, uh, since I'm close to set, I don't you know, sit in video village, um, even though my DPs are very often on headsets with their camera operators, um, uh, they might be giving adjustments as we go. Um, but uh, occasionally I'll, unless it's a steady cam operator and then I don't touch them, but I might go up to the shoulder and go, push in or, you know, you know, or why now, whatever. Uh, but I don't do that very often because we've done enough rehearsals. Um, and also I love to trust my operators that, you know, what they see and their instincts, you know, are good. And, you know, I, I always feel like they're real collaborators. And so often some of them are, you know, directors themselves, you yeah. know, that, um, so, um, uh, we're almost always on the same page. Um, and again, if it's a complicated thing, we've hopefully worked it out with second team um, or rehearsed it enough with first team. And also I shoot rehearsals sometimes. Um, obviously rehearsals where hair and makeup have, have done their work, but I will um, see if we can capture um, magic in the bottle right out of the mm, game. Mm. Um, as long as the actors feel like they're ready. Um, so and you, and you now the only person that cheats sometimes is the focus puller but I will always stop during a second team rehearsal for a focus puller to use their laser or use their tape measure and and it's not done enough anymore because their monitors are so good in terms of them um, pulling focus but I will say measure it this is a long walk and talk <laughs> give yourself markers wherever you need them so that we're re you're you're doing it by the numbers, the old-fashioned way. It works still. What do you mean they cheat? Um, I can't. They. I th did I they, say cheat? I thought you said cheat. Oh, Folks oh, 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 Sometimes they'll, they'll they'll just be doing it by looking at their monitors. I and see. So that's what you're calling cheat. The monitors wow. I we now have literally have graphs of when things are oh wow in or out of focus focus wow. yeah it's like, oh that's God, cool it's like, it's like piano tuning by yeah. the, as opposed to piano tuners who still right right wow like gosh this is amazing but they can do it that way and it, it, it and it cheats them of their rehearsal to get something for instance let's say i'm in the foreground um you're on a profile of me or the back and then i'm going to turn into camera and it has to be that rock focused to my face in focus has to be immediate. You know, they have to know exactly, you know, what focal mm -hmm. length to switch to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, if I haven't given them that rehearsal, they're doing it by feel. Now, a lot of focus pullers are amazing. And yeah. I will always acknowledge a hard shot that they get. And I'll go up to them, you know, especially when we're moving on to the next shot and go, that was amazing. Thank you. You know, because... 
I couldn't do it. <laughs> right, yeah. Mary Lou Belli, filmmaker, director, thank you so much for being on the show. Great wisdom. Thank you, thank you. And I'll send you the um, link for Director's Tell the Story. Awesome. All right, okay. until next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.